Hi, everyone. Welcome to our uh, first team event of 2023, a second event of the year. Thanks so much for joining us. We're quite excited about this one because we are bringing you an update on Skylark that I know many of you have been waiting for. I am going to introduce Clayton in a second, but just to remind you, we'll be taking about 45 minutes to this session and we'll have questions at the end. Uh, and if you have to go, come back to this link, there'll be a recording shortly afterwards. So I'll bring Clayton in. Hello. Thanks, Mel. Hi, everyone. Hi. Uh, thanks for joining. And um, yeah, I, I'm really uh, excited to, to show you what we've been working on. Um, it's been a busy few months, really. Um, and uh, a lot has been happening behind the scenes, which you haven't seen. Um, so this is a chance to sort of pre present, what, um, I guess, the story of Skylark's development so far and where, um, where we're up to and um, how you sort of get your hands on it. Um, I'm just going to share my screen, if that's all right. OK, so I guess the story of WikiHouse, um, most of you will know quite well already, and it's been this fantastic um, sort of growing community and uh, experiment and knowledge base that's that's developed over, over the, a number of years. Um, and we've we're already starting to see this sort of grow and flourish, um, thanks in part to the, to the excellent work the community has done, um, and, um, and a large part to sort of um, recent changes in terms of the new forum we, uh, we've been using um, uh, and obviously developed a Skylark itself, which is built on um, years of prototyping different connection systems, looking at not just the sort of buildability and construction aspect, but how the sort of whole holistic view of, um, of construction and how we can incrementally, uh, hopefully sort of more than incrementally, improve the way we build. Um, and this has brought us to Skylark, which is taking the very best bits of what we've learned and sort of condensing it down to a system that makes it, the whole thing much more standardized, much simpler. Um, and so since we last presented this uh, a few months ago, back in, I think it was October, um, we sort of showed some of the recent projects we've done and where uh, WikiHouse is going to next. And uh, our aim hasn't changed, which is to, to try and make uh, zero carbon construction as easy as possible. And in the first version of Skylark, um, we put out this online library um, through our website, which anyone can go on and download um, the various blocks that they need. It's got information around um, the amount of, sort of cutting sheets, amount of insulation in it contained in each block. And essentially, these are your basic building cassettes that you can use to, to make a range of different designs from. Um, and we always knew that that library started quite small, and we always wanted to grow it and develop it so that it could um, sort of bring a whole lot more in terms of architectural options. Um, uh, I guess sort of structural knowledge potentially, and um, and also we know the system itself would, would develop and improve. So uh, this library is always going to be something that's that's um, uh, that's being iterated on. But also we we know that we also want to get to a point of having a product that's stable enough that people can can um, can jump in and use it and know that um, uh, the the basics are are, are, are pretty well um, developed and, and honed now. So, since that release, we've um, we've seen the community really pick that up and, and run with it. It's been um, been a sort of crazy year, really. So we've um, we've had projects in the UK, um, uh, which some we've been directly involved with the Open Systems Lab. Others where people have just taken the, the system and, um, and and built structures with it. Um, uh, everything from sort of student prototypes to backyard studios um, to community workshops, and and then much more further afield globally, um, as far as New Zealand, Chile, um, some huge projects happened in the USA with Chelsea Fab Lab, and, um, and looking at sort of more recently some disaster relief scenarios with um, uh, uh, obviously emergency housing, refugee housing in Ukraine, um, groups in Turkey, and the sort of possibilities and um, applications for Kiosk Alak really has grown um, along with the system itself. So yeah, we're, we're just excited to see where that continues to develop. The sort of closer to home for us here in the UK, um, last time we built um, this uh, uh, barn and, um, and uh, sort of home office studio um, in the Peak District. Um, this was our sort of really first hands-on Skylark project. And this is really what we call 0.1, where, where there's a whole lot of 
elements in here that you might recognize and that very quickly we realized were, um, well, yeah, while they may make sense, so from a structural perspective, they really sort of slowed down the, the work on site or added a lot of extra um, challenges in terms of insulating and um, and, uh, and generally the, the speed of construction. So the, the end product of that was um, turned out really, really well. Um, all kudos to the client, um, Tim, who um, had a, um, a lot of involvement in this and, and really, um, uh, yeah, did a fantastic job in terms of finishing it off. Um, but the, the big lesson from that was that what we were using as a connection method, uh, mechanism between the first floor, um, ground floor, and, um, uh, and, and the walls was um, a series of these purple combs and these red pegs, as they're shown here, um, which was just a bit of a pain to try and align and get everything in place. The pegs themselves, you have to either put through the line of insulation or do the insulation afterwards. We looked at various other sort of insulation types that might work here, but really the combs themselves were almost like their own logic to the system. That meant it's really hard to, if you're building on site for the first time um, and you're trying to use it as a as a self-builder um, who hasn't had any experience of the system, it, it's really uh, hard to get your head around how the, how the combs fit in and, and when they need to fit in. Um, even with instructions, um, it, it just seemed like there's a better way of doing this, right? Do we need combs at all? And so that was our big, big question. And when we look at the next version, which is 0.2, we 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 did some engineering testing, which Gabriella will um, will give you a bit of a breakdown on um, uh, in a few minutes. But it was to try and say, okay, well, let's let's get away with the need for pegs and combs. Let's use what is the most effective part of Skylock, which is these bow ties, which really do a great job of locking the cassettes together. Um, and, um, and 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 are really easy to put together on site. You know, you don't really need any mechanical fixings. There's no screws required in, the, in this. It's literally just a case of tapping in um, these bow ties, um, which is such an easy easy task. So the bow ties themselves, we also wanted to improve. And one of them was to actually shrink them down and add more of them. Um, so we're actually getting much, almost two times greater performance out of the, the wall system than we had previously which allows us to do much more in terms of um, the types of uh, wind conditions we can build in, the, the heights and, and various other things, um, uh, which Gabriella will elaborate on. And then bring those comb, um, those uh, bow ties into the connections, into the, the floors and the, um, the roofs as well. Uh, and then we got the chance to, to, to build that, right? And to prototype that with um, this uh, pavilion um, uh, with, with Pooleyville and Milton Keynes, where um, it's a part of a touring um, archive that um, that was deconstructed and reconstructed, I think, five or six times in different locations around Milton Keynes in the space of about a month. And that was a great uh, test case for, for how these bow tie connections can be used in, in place of combs um, everywhere in the structure. Um, and this is qu quite a sort of challenging and unusual design as well, um, which again uh, brought its own lessons. And yeah, this photo really illustrates the, um, the sort of stitching of those bow ties between the, the roof elements and the wall elements. So that, um, uh, makes it nice and clear how that all works. Um, there is a quick video. Um, I think you've probably all seen this before on YouTube, um, but go take a look. It's, um, and go take a look at the, um, uh, the work that um, the MK, MK archive was, um, was doing as well. It's really, really cool. So, So next for us is um, so what does what does the 0.2 sort of public release look like? Um, because uh, it's all well and good um, us sort of tinkering away in the background and having some input from people on the ground who we built directly with, but actually it's, it's time this this is part of the the whole library update to to um, the wiki house that anyone can go forth and use and download and build with, um, and uh, and this is what it contains. So everything that's that that's in here. Is, is part of two different series of Skylark. There's a Skylark 200, um, which is uh, ultimately suited for um, ideally single story, um, uh, smaller buildings, things like garden studios, work pods. Um, uh, uh, yeah, um, anything where there's, there's not a large amount of structural loads um, and, and probably smaller spans. Um, in, the, in the future, we might potentially make this um, into more of a multi-story option as well. But um, basically, where the insulation values are less and the spans are less, 
uh, Skylark 200 is probably going to fit fit your um, fit your needs, and uh, and then Skylark 250, where we've got um, more span options, larger span options, um, uh, different roof options, and um, and things like stairs, which I'll come to in a minute. So this is really how how it breaks down. Um, uh, sorry, those labels actually run the wrong way. 250 series here is um, the uh, is the largest span, up to 5.4 meters currently, um, and that's the the large span. And the 200 series, where you've got um, the much smaller spans, down to 2.4. So really, if you're looking at making sort of small um, uh, workspaces like garden pods, um, uh, this this is really well suited. Um, the basic floor blocks um, come with notches for um, uh, for timber bearers, which I'll um, I'll show you in a minute. Um, so there's a standard detail which just involves a timber sole plate that goes through there and some screws to connect that to to whatever foundations you know, you're building on. Um, and then in terms of wall heights, um, there is another option that wasn't there before, which is the large the 2.7 meter high walls. So we've now got um, a, a range that covers the most. Um, uh, and again, we're trying to hit sort of 80% of what most people need, which is um, uh, if you if you generally building within these these sort of parameters, standardized sizes, um, you can get a, um, yeah, a range of different uh, sort of ceiling heights and roof heights out of um, out of these standard blocks. And there's always the option to make something more bespoke, but um, the, our sort of get, goal is to try and save you time in terms of design. Um, and time on site and um, and uh, so the lead in time for construction as well. So anything we can do to make that make that simpler by, by having the standardized library um, is, uh, is something we're very keen on um, uh, on doing. So uh, and again, different roof types. Um, so we've introduced a 42 degree gable. Um, again, these comes up, they come in the range of all the spans that I mentioned before. Uh, the 200 series has a, a, a nearly flat roof, um, which has a, a very slight fall in it. Um, which, if you try to build under permitted development regulations, um, that's um, that's sort of ideal for. And then um, in the two hundred and fifty series, there's a ten degree fall um, uh, um, uh, pent monoslope roof, which is um, in most cases will be from the two point one or two point four meter high um, uh, wall to the three meter high wall, um, and that works at different spans. Um, I can show you that um, when I do a bit of a demonstration. And then windows, um, and we try to give um, uh, so build a library of, of really nicely proportioned windows designs. That um, again, this is just going to be the starting point. People will will want something that's probably slightly different to this on, on some projects. But the the standard ones we want to offer are ones that you know, work really nicely in proportion with the types of walls and roofs and heights that are part of the, the rest of the Skylark library. Um, so it makes it really hard to to make a building that's um, that's not going to look good in the end. Um, and now we have stairs. So uh, again, the stairs heights work with the different floor heights. Um, so the small uh, one works with a small uh, wall height where you've got up to 2.1 meters. Um, so um, then, well, obviously from floor, finish floor level to upper finish floor level. And, this, and then the other ones, uh, uh, I think you have 2.4, 2.7, and three meters as well. And they're designed to sort of hook a little bit onto the top of the, um, uh, the finished floor panels. Um, and uh, sort of inbuilt stringers um, and all those nested parts and cutting files are there as well. Um, and they can be useful buildings which aren't Skylark, of course, as well, if that's if that's useful. Um, and then that all goes together to make um, a sort of finished chassis. So without taking too much time, um, I can uh, very quickly sort of show you that, um, what the design kit looks like and some of the things you can do with it. Um, so here we have uh, the Skylark 250 design kit um, in, in SketchUp format. Um, again, there will be a range of different um, CAD file types you can download, um, as we've had before, um, including things like um, uh, like Blender, um, to try and make that really available and accessible to to anyone who wants to to, to design. Um, I'm showing SketchUp because that's the, um, the free one that more well, freely available through the web than um, a lot of people sort of start to get into. Um, uh, and if you're a sort of experienced seasoned designer, then um, then there's probably something else you're using, but um, uh, this is a good, a good indication. So we've got all the um, different roof forms here. And the, the basic sort of building system is that you start with a, with a floor span. Um, and 
we've got here, this is the 5.4 meter span. This just uh, arrays along the length of the building that you want to make, so to, to whatever sort of length you need. Um, you can go to sort of quite, yeah, so infinite lengths along that one, five meter internal span in this, in this case here. Um, from there, then you can choose uh, various roof, um, uh, sorry, wall options. Um, let's say you're taking this as a standard 2.4 meter, oh, this is the 2.7 meter high wall. Um, now the new connection here is where it literally just rests on top. There are small notches um, designed to um, uh, to stop the, um, the cassettes from moving too much in that direction while, you, while you're building. Um, but once they're on, you can you can almost straight away um, start to lock them in place with some bow ties. And there are uh, four sort of standard bow tie options. This one's a bit funny. I'll show you how that works. Um, but the standard one is um, it's a blended bow tie, and once you've got that, you can then use that to actually plug those holes. Um, one here. So there's, there's a line of bow ties ex externally and a line of bow ties internally. Um, there's a little trick to fitting these ones on site um, uh, using a, bit, a little bit of a wedge or an angle hammer, but the, essentially the, the, the gap is enough just to allow these resized smaller bow ties to fit quite nicely into there and make that, um, make that connection work internally, which is what helps provide a lot of the extra strength that we've gained since um, the update of the system. Then at the, at the end of your house, um, there is an end beam. Um, that sits on this side here. Um, I'm not sure yet. Um, so this is the where the gable wall will sit. Um, again, that locks into place um, uh, along there. And this whole system is um, is then designed to sit on on top of um, uh, has a channel for for a bearer plate. Um, nominally a 200 um, a deep uh, sole plate. Um, and the the standard fixing is that you put screws through. The outside of this plywood into that um, that that bearer plate um, to um, to help tie the um, the working house structure down to the foundations. Um, in the corners, then there is um, there's a corner post. It helps you uh, turn the corner around from the walls to the to the edges. Um, so you can find the corner post that matches the wall height that you're looking at using. Um, and this this can just be rotated to uh, to the side where you've got bow ties externally. You can see here facing those two directions. Um, and again, that helps um, make the connection around those, those two sides. Um, the same wall blocks um, can then be used for, uh, for the gable walls. Or if you have a pitched roof, um, like you might have here, you can too, you can take the span that corresponds with the span of the floor. So in this case, um, this is the uh, 42 degree um, large span. I just need to flip that around. And then there's a series of walls here um, to make up that span. So depending on the, the wall height that we st started with, um, you then can choose the angled walls that fit in with that, that roof span. Um, and then there's also roof blocks. So these um, pitch roof blocks are, um, uh, there's only one side shown here, but that's because they, they can be rotated, right? So there's a small, um, uh, they're sort of asymmetrical at the top. So if you spin them around like this, um, and this is basically how you build it on site, is that these two um, lock together and form the, the sort of ridge of the roof. Um, and this whole structure then can then um, plug into 
haben wir gerade her. My computer starts does not to auto save. Yeah. And then this roof. Again, just like the floor, copies over. So it seems like a little bit of modeling work. But basically, all the elements that you need is, are there. Um, and from that, you can quite easily construct a house. And, and what we know from this is that actually, while, while you're doing it, is, is you've got access to a whole lot of data behind this, which is the from the block library and from um, our Airtable database, which we'll be um, uh, linking through um, very shortly to the rest of the library, is the, the quantities and costs for all the elements um, in here that link to the types of blocks that you're using. So you can um, uh, go into here, you can download, um, uh, uh, you can export a, a CSV um, of the um, um, of all the data in here, and you can build your own spreadsheets off the back of that if you want to, um, for doing um, material so takeoffs and quantities. Uh, or you can um, uh, just use that air table as a reference. Um, and then um, you've got, you know very quickly how many sheets are in, are in your structure. You can reference into the structure engineering informa information, um, and you can um, you've got a whole lot of sort of really um, uh, accurate building information at, sort of at your fingertips right to begin with. Normally, this stuff is happens much further down the, the sort of design um, journey, but um, one of the benefits of using these these standard boxes that you you know from the offset. Um, uh, the, the entire sort of structural quantities of, of your of your design. So if I go back very quickly, um, sorry, Mel, I think you're on mute. Uh, thanks. I I think we've lost Clayton for a bit. Uh, Gabri, would you like to? Um, join us and tell us a bit about your work yeah sure i can let me see if i can share my screen we'll come back to clayton i'm sure he's he's on his way back so don't worry <laughs> and you'll have we all have uh, time for questions at the end as well okay can you see my screen yes perfect so um welcome everyone um after um clayton's talk i just would like to give you a little bit more details about some of the work that was going behind the scenes, um, especially about the new structural engineering guideline that will be available. So um, as you probably, um, some of you might know, um, we have been doing uh, um, for the past year or so, even two years, quite, quite a bit of testing um, about the structural performance of Skylark. So we did test the walls, the beams, the connections and, and so on and so forth. And everything that we did, um, went into our engineering guideline, which was available on the website. And uh, um, you see here a, a screencast of it. And that wasn't, that wasn't too bad. I think, I think it was helpful for engineering engineers, structural engineers come to design um, a wiki house building, a scalar building for the first time. So um, it was kind of um, useful uh, in the sense of was provided some um, data about structural testing so all the tests that we did was there, um, and it was providing a lot of details about the experiment, um, and that that was that was um, kind of helpful. But um, I also think there were there's quite a good um, room for improvement, and 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 there were quite a few um, things that we we could have done better. For example, from a user friendly um, perspective, um, our previous engineering guidelines add all the the structural parameters and the testing data all on the same page. So it was, it was a very long document that you need to scroll down. And that might be okay if it's the first time you design Skylark. So maybe you're a structural engineer, so you want to know the capacity of a beam. Um, you find that that number you're looking for is 10 in a table. And then you, you say, oh, hang on a minute. Where does that number come from? So you, you read everything. But then the second time you need to design a scalar building or the third time, you don't want to go through the whole document again. You just, you just want to 
to remember if that double check if that number is 10 or 9 or 7 so um that's some work we we, we did actually to 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 improve the user and friendly side i'll show you more details um soon um as Clayton would say, we, we updated the system. So now the, the system, you got rid of combs um, and pegs, and now the main connection is the bow tie. So we want the, the new version of the guideline to look like, um, to be suitable for, for version 1.2. Um, and then now we, we actually have two series of blocks. So we have a scalar 250, a scalar 200. So uh, that's something we, we need to have in the guideline as well, because um, um, we want to cover all, all the possible options for, for structural engineer that, that come on the job. And then there was a, the, the, the personal challenge for me was, was number four, which uh, we were working with some engineers in, in, in New Zealand and, and, and the States. And what, what if they are using a different plywood or a different timber material that is not exactly the one we tested? Um, so in the guidelines, the previous guideline we have, that's fine. We were providing some experimental data. Um, so that, that they're helpful in the sense of in you 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 my using a plywood that is more or less similar or 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 um, fairly similar so you you can somehow extrapolate some information but can we do better here can we provide a more rational system for structural engineers to design with that is material independent and uh, and another thing is probably more from from our side or OSL side we keep doing a lot of testing. Uh, we have some new testing coming on in, in, in a couple of weeks at Imperial College. How do we deal with, with, um, with expanding our, our knowledge that, that we have about the system, and not just from a structural perspective, but um, life cycle analysis and, and, and any sort of research that we have? Um, probably just having a single guideline with, with a lot of information was not the best way forward. So we, we, we try to work um, to take all these issues. And uh, this is how the new guideline looks like. Um, this is the section about, about the BIMs. You, you will see, you can see on the, on, on the left side of the screen that the navigation menu is much smaller. And uh, um, also the information that is there um, is smaller in size, but more comprehensive. You see that um, what we provide over there are design tables. And span tables. So if you if you're a structural engineer, you're looking for a number for a formula. That's what you need probably. Um, so you can you can find everything there. It is more user friendly. Is for version 0.2. It covers both scalar 250 and 200. So hopefully that's that's a step forward. And at the end of each section, each of the block that you need, there are two links that you can click on. One redirects you to the um, a work example. So how to use the the tables that, that we provide, and a link that, that send you to um, if you want to know more. So how this, where does these numbers and formulas come from? So the link about the formula sent us to a new part of the website that we created, which is which is a research collection, and is um, sort of part of our website where we uploaded all the information that we have. Um, in this case, about structural testing. So for any test that we did so far, um, you will find your own a specific entry with a summary of the research project, um, most likely a YouTube video about the experiment. And you can, uh, um, you can see here, for example, in the case of the BIMS, you can download a PDF where there's um, details about the experimental setup. Um, if, if you're an engineering geek or if, you're a, if you want to know more about the formulas, that's the place where you look for, um, where you can find all this information. And we also um, provided a very nice database with all the experimental data, the photos, everything. So um, that is very useful for us when we work with research entities like universities and, and, and um, so people can, can access all the data um, open source. Um, the, the biggest challenge was try to to tell before that the, the the elephant in the room is is what what if um, some people or what if someone wants to use a different material than the one we tested? That was a personal um, thing, a personal limitation that, that I've seen in the gun and that I really wanted to address now that we that we move forward. And uh, and uh, how can we how can we tackle that? So let me let me just 
give you some examples with, with concrete since, since we know that concrete beams are, are fairly common around the world. So if you, if you want to design a concrete beams, um, there are some variables that you, that you need to know. For example, the concrete type, the reinforcement type, uh, the geometry of the beams, the water to cement ratio, the number of bars, and the position of the bars. And there are many others. So all, all these variables affect the performance of your, of your concrete beam. But what we do as structural engineer is not that we, there's, there's no one in the world that tests all the possible combination of these variables. We as structural engineers have some, some structural models, some, some mechanical models that for certain given input, the concrete type, we can describe the performance of the system, the concrete beam. So how does it look like for, for Skylark, this sort of thinking? Well, when, when we did the testing, we had a system response. So we could imagine, for example, in the case of the BIMs, we can measure the capacity of the BIMs. But we also know the basic ingredients. So we know the performance of the material. Why, why do we know that? Not just because we tested, but because every material they use from, for, for structural use comes what is so-called a declaration of performance. So your manufacturer is going to give you a table that is going to tell you, okay, this is the stress, uh, limit stress of your, of your plywood or limit stress of your OSB. And, and, and if you can crack on and you can find the correlation between the two, you find what is the structural model of the system. You find this correlation. So if, you, if you're able to provide a structural model for that, then for any given material that you have the declaration of performance, you can calculate the system response. So how does it work for, for, for Skylark? Well, in the case of the BIMs, for example, we, we tested some BIMs. Um, by looking at the DSC, by looking at the experiments, we realized, for example, that the behavior was dominated by the, by the tabs in, in, in the bottom flange. And then we came up with a, with a structural model for the tabs based on, on, on equilibrium, based on some engineering theories. And then at the end of the day, what we have is a simple formula or a series of formulas that can capture that behavior. And then at the end of the journey, the formula goes into the engineering guideline, so it can be nice and tidy. And all the surrounding background, the theory, goes into the research page. So when you, when you come across the website, you, 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 you can look at the numbers if you just need the numbers, or you can have the comprehensive knowledge if you, if you want to do that. But I guess the good thing is that once you read the, once you read the research once, then, then you're okay with that. You don't need to read it again every time you design a a new Skylark BIM. And this is another example, for example, for the bow ties, we test the bow ties, we realized by looking at the DSC that the, the, the contact zone between the bow tie and the external panel was the critical um, the failing element. We came up with, with some theory, some mathematical explanation of that, some structural model, which led us to a nice and simple formula or a series of formula. And again, the formula goes into the engineering guideline and the research in the research page, we have an item describing the whole, the whole process. Um, so that allows us to, to have a very nice and tidy um, section of the design guideline with, with span tables and that kind of thing, which hopefully is more um, user-friendly and, and, and can be used with different sort of materials. Um, you will find that most of the formulas over there, um, if not all the formulas, um, allow you to, to use any material as long as you have the, um, you know, have the material is, is behaving. And then I guess the last part um, is the, um, some work examples. So um, if you design in Europe or, or in the UK, you're probably designing with the um, Euro codes or the British standard. So um, we provide some work examples that really take you step by step um, on how to use the formulas um, and, and uh, make sure that your design is, is um, safe and sound. And I think that's all from my side. Um, Thanks, Gabri. Uh, and Clayton has found his way back to us. Hello. <laughs> um, should we go back to your slides, Clayton? Yeah, um, I've added them. Do you want me to share my screen instead? Yes, please. Yes.
Okay, welcome back, everyone. Uh, sorry, I lost you. It was uh, just at the very end. Just as getting the good stuff. Um, so, what I was just going to say to wrap up on um, on the uh, latest library release is that everything should be going live in the library tomorrow. Um, uh, there's some final finishing touches that we're just doing. Uh, we're hoping to have it in time um, for the presentation day, but it'll be tomorrow, um, and that will include everything that I've shown you um, uh, just before, um, and then you can go and use it and do. Um, do uh, whatever you want with it, really. Um, there is um, some other stuff that's coming um, uh, off the back of that, which is um, uh, more design kit file formats. Um, we are going to add all the CNC cutting files. Um, most of them are, are ready prepped now. Um, they're just going to be added to the library um, via the GitHub links. Uh, there is um, assembly manuals um, uh, that takes a little bit longer to produce, so we'll have those already. Um, in total, we have 195 blocks in the library now. So um, you can appreciate the sort of um, the infrastructure and the systems you have to build to to get keep these maintained, um, and also which something you'll notice is, is missing at the minute, which is gable end um, uh, window and door options um, for for pitch roofs. Um, so that will um, uh, be going. That's the, the next um, next item on the list, ready to go into the library, um, and then uh, we'll be uh, writing a, a much more detailed general assembly guide, which talks about what well, I talked about already today, which is to um, show how you can go from um, your sort of pre-manufactured blocks that are ready to go on site um, and build up the various connections to foundations um, all the way up to sort of finishing and cladding and um, uh, and uh, fitting out uh, the finished wiki house. Um, the, we do have some sort of standard design uh, details for how you finish up off everything. We're very keen to to take um, people's thoughts on um, on uh, other materials, other types, other ways of of, um, of skinning and finishing um, houses internally and, and externally as well, um, using the, the basic chassis. Then we've done um, a sort of a little bit of thinking on um, the whole life carbon side of things as well. This is going to be a bigger area of research for us um, going forward. Um, off the back of an excellent report that um, uh, Leeds Sustainability Institute did, um, uh, um, uh, for some research that we partnered with them on, um, where we looked at um, uh, uh, life cycle carbon analysis for a typical, typical wiki house versus typical brick and block house. And, and the interesting sort of questions around, okay, uh, end of life and, um, and reuse uh, circularity of those components. And even with a sort of basic 40, uh, minimum 40%, um, material reuse um, of the structure, we can already, um, uh, we're already at net zero, slightly below it, um, compared to um, sort of typical um, uh, reuse of a brick and block house. Um, and that saving of 39 uh, tons of uh, CO2 is equivalent, equivalent to driving a petrol car around the world um, seven times. So um, that's for an individual, say 93 square meter, two bed house. So these are the sorts of impacts that we can have um, uh, at, at scale um, by, by using better methods and um, better technology um, and much better building materials. Um, so as well as uh, encouraging people to go out and DIY and, and jump in um, with two feet and, and, and prototype and build themselves, uh, we do also offer a range of services um, for project design work. Um, and that's through directly through us and also through, um, uh, through a various partners and, um, and collaborators. So we we do a chassis design service, um, which a lot of people have already used, where we can help um, build up a 3D model chassis for you and coordinate with engineering. Um, but there's also a, a growing network of providers, and some of this I'm very keen to, to expand this year. Um, we've worked with um, a number of manufacturers um, already, um, but we want to try and grow the Wikias um, designer um, List, which is architects, um, uh, architectural designers, um, uh, design build uh, uh, companies, um, freelancers, anyone who's got interest in um, in providing design services for people who are looking to get wiki houses um, from sort of concept ideas to to a sort of finished article, um, and so we're trying to support the, um, them with um, uh, with referrals really, but also with um, with tools and, um, and design knowledge that they can go in and um, sort of design confidently with Wikihouse um, and, and Wikihouse details. And then also a network of, of Wikihouse engineers. So um, 
uh, again, engineering practices and consultancies who are, um, have a bit of background knowledge of WikiHouse or um, um, built, um, built projects with it before, um, or who are keen to build projects with it, um, who can use our uh, engineering guide um, that Gabriella mentioned um, as a resource to, um, to perform structure calculations and checks for, uh, for building regulations and, um, and Eurocode um, uh, design limits. Uh, and then we already have a list of manufacturers and that's going to continue to grow, which is really exciting. So um, up around the country now we have um, uh, workshops who are um, sort of prepped and ready to, to take up WikiHouse orders um, and, um, and build, your, build a project. Um, so we always welcome um, uh, experience of interest of others who are keen to offer those services. And uh, the other big focus is installers, so um, companies um, who are um, who want to go? There might be manufacturers as well, or just site installers who can come in and do the sort of chassis install and erection and set up on site, and um, can offer those professional services as well as um, the various um, uh, CDM requirements and, um, and 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 site um, understanding of site regulations, um, and also sort of on-site training support to others um, uh, who can oversee um, uh, the WikiHouse build process. For people who, um, whether either that's a large complex project, or people who um, would, would rather not sort of have to, have to DIY it, um, which is always an option, of course. Um, so where are we on the sort of goals that we presented back a few months ago? Um, we've um, uh, released the early, early development branches um, that a few of you have already seen already. Um, we have um, pretty much updated the library now. Um, like I said, that goes live um, tomorrow. And we are um, doing some of the um, uh, some more tests and project builds um, uh, that should be starting once a couple of them starting on site in the next month. Um, this uh, Mel has done some excellent work on the transition to the new community forum, and it's great to see some sort of momentum and, and interest picking up there. Um, we'll continue these monthly web series, um, and um, we're also working uh, with Imperial College um, in, in London on some structural testing at the minute, um, or will be in the next month or so. And um, and then uh, we'll do a separate um, presentation on the digital configurator, which should make this whole process of building with blocks um, at least for for small structures um, a lot a lot more straightforward, and um, for people who don't have care knowledge. Um, but more on that very soon. Mel, uh, do you want to uh, talk a bit more about uh, what's coming up next in terms of events? Yeah, so we are sticking to our Thursday um, afternoon for the March event. We are going to be joined by Architecture Unknown, who are based in England, and they're going to be telling us about some exciting projects they've got in the pipeline. So that is, that's our uh, March event, put it in your calendars, but I'll also do a post about it. Um, and as always, just, you know, join the community if you haven't already. Uh, it's, yeah, it's great to hear what you're up to. It's great to see you helping each other. Um, yeah. Have we are we done? Do we need questions now? We've got quite a few to go through. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to bring in Gabri and Alyssa who have been waiting. Um, hi guys. Uh, so we've got a question from Jennifer. Uh, she's interested in knowing a little bit more about the suitability of 0.2 were real life projects. Um, so has 0.2 been tested in real life beyond Milton Keynes specifically or su specifically on suitability for larger structures? Anybody like to answer that? Uh, I'll take the first bit. I think maybe Gabri can elaborate on the on some of the, the structural side. But um, no, we haven't built any larger structures yet with 0.2. Um, the Milton Keynes one was biggest, but there are other people who are prototyping with it around the world at the, at the minute. Um, but we are more than confident. In fact, more confident than we are in 0.1. And um, the 0.2 is is the way forward, um, uh, based on some of the structural testing we've done, um, a lot of the engineering analysis, and there will be some. Um, there are sort of in late stage design at the minute, a couple of 0.2 structures. Like I said, they'll be on site in the next month. Um, uh, Gabri, anything more on the structural side that uh, you can talk about? Um, yeah, I can quickly, quickly uh, perhaps mention um, that we did a little bit of testing on the new connection with the new bow ties um, and they seem behaving significantly better. Um, if I can comment briefly, we were doing a design for a project in New Zealand. And uh, um, I can't remember the, the site, I think it was around Wellington, but there was a significant fault. So um, there was quite a bit of horizontal loads coming from the earthquake. And uh, um, I think there was quite a little bit of wind load. Um, and uh, it was interesting because we were transitioning between 0.1 and 0.2. 
And if we were to design with 0.1, we were not being able to target the goal uh, imposed by the New Zealand standard building code. But with 0.2, we were um, quite comfortably beyond the limit. So, um, so yeah, that was quite a good thing to see. So, um, yeah, we are pretty happy with the new with the new improvement. Brilliant. Thanks. We've got a question from Vincent. I'm going to go to now. That's for you, Clayton. Uh, are we thinking of a 300 system in the future? Uh, not. Uh, it, it won't evolve any difference to the actual wiki house geometry. So the, the, the big limits to, to, uh, to the sort of thickness of those walls with using structural sheet material is that the, um, is the efficiency of the nesting the parts. And as soon as you get to 300, um, you, you start to lose efficiency quite dramatically. In fact, anything a bit more over 250. Um, ours is actually, if you look at the total wall depth, is, um, is, is, it, is it more than 250? I think that's the, um, the insulation depth. If you wanted to build, if you needed 300 mils of insulation, the easier answer would be to use an external um, wood fiber board insulation or even an internal insulation to be, really beef up um, the thermal performance if you need to. Um, I would think that 250 is probably enough for most. And like I said, in the floor, the cavity is actually deeper than 250. It's about 280. Um, but where you need extra insulation, you would use either internally or externally another layer of something rather than spend extra money on the structure, which doesn't need to be any thicker than it is. Um, and the same could be said for 200 as well. If you wanted 200 sort of um, uh, cost efficiency, but with a bit of extra insulation, then you could also look at a wood fiber board for that too. Thanks for that. Uh, we've got a question from Belgium. So uh, I am part of a Belgian company which plans to make a tiny house in a hangar using 250 modules with six meter spans. We ask ourselves the question if it is possible to achieve this in OSB. I can probably take this one. Um, I guess, uh, um, the question will be um, what type of OSB you're using. So you can probably do a quick calculation sanity check um, because for example, I know that some of the OSB that is produced in the US is stronger than the OSB we have access here in the UK. So um, the short answer will be um, if it's a single story, I think you probably can because the amount of load that goes on the roof is, is not that much. If it's a two-story building, then it depends on the property of your OSB. If you think that your the capacity of the material is fairly similar, it can reach around 15, 20 MPA in compression, um, then you can probably can. If it's lower, then probably I will either break the span down or, or use a different type of um, material. Brilliant, and I think we've got a very fun... quickly. Sorry, oh, sorry. Just, uh, just uh, sorry, uh, just add time to that. It's also worth, aside from the structural side of things as well, it's worth bearing in mind. Obviously, the weight numbers in the database will be wrong. Um, they're they're based on plywood, and that's definitely something you experience when you're building with OSB on site. You can really feel the difference. It's about uh, 150 percent heavier. I think generally spruce plywood's around sort of 400 to 500 ki um, kilograms per cubic meter. And, OSB tends to be more like 600. So um, you have to sort of, it sounds like you're building it in a, in a hangar. So you should be in kind of good shape, but making sure you've kind of got the lifting equipment uh, and you've sort of planned, mm. planned for, that, for that additional weight. Yes, thank you. We've got a follow-up question actually about um, roof windows. Um, so how to make a roof window in the one or two degree roof or even in the spans themselves? Yeah, so that, that is something we have done um, on some early pilots um, uh, where, so the thing is we will be adding blocks for those for those roof windows for some fairly standardized sizes again of roof window. Um, alternatively, if you've got a project underway, you can work with a structural engineer to, to work out um, how to um, and where to split those, those spans. Um, if, if the window is obviously uh, less than 600 millimeters wide, um, that's very easy. Uh, it gets a bit more tricky when the window is wider than, than that. You end up with a sort of double block, essentially, um, uh, with some extra um, uh, uh, sort of plywood joists in there to help strengthen that side. Um, but we will release standard blocks for, for roof windows to go with the spans um, uh, in, the, in the near future because, um, yeah, we all, there's obviously a need there. Um, and it's a nice architectural feature. 
Thank you. Um, we've got a question from Stephen about the configurator. Who would like to take that? Should I go on that one? I, we won't, we won't uh, ruin too much about this, but um, so it's actually a project that we've been working on for quite a long time um, under the name BuildX. And it's actually, a, so it's going to be a web-based tool. And it's certainly something that, uh, in theory, is designed to be able to support any number of, or, you know, a whole range of possible building systems like WikiHouse or others as well. But um, as always, we're kind of going to guinea pig it on ourselves. Guinea pig it on ourselves. And as Clayton said, the the main thing is, you know, with the design kits now, hopefully, as it was, I, you know, you saw Clayton doing that earlier. You know, you can go and get your blocks and drop drop them in, etc. But it's still a quite manual process to do that. And then to go and get your window piece and then to tot up all your blocks and to work out what the cost will be, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it will be a little web-based tool that will allow you to do that. And it will, auto, you know, you'll just be stretching and pulling a house and, and it will it will calculate or at least some estimates based on estimates, all that information for you. So hopefully it will just make it a little bit easier, a little bit quicker uh, to download. It, will, it won't be perfect. Definitely the sorts of things that you can um, download and export from it, it formats, et cetera, will be limited. But like everything, we'll, we'll get it to a point where we think it's just about good enough, and then we'll put it out there for, for everyone to just play with and explore and, and tell us how, how we can improve it. And I think initially, probably, it will only be supporting, it will only have WikiHouse 200 on it, and then we'll see how it goes, and then we'll add um, WikiHouse, sorry, Skylark 200, and then we'll probably add Skylark 250 in due course. Thank you. Uh, another question from Jennifer here. We're coming to the end of the questions because I know we're running a little bit late, but um, we have Swift has some standard models developed by Vincent and his team for people to choose an off-the-shelf design. Will we do the same for Skylark? Uh, in a way, I, I, that's a kind of continuation of the last one. So this is, it's been a question, it's been a thing that's come up for a long time that People want kind of standard house types, but almost always people don't want exactly that. They want to change it a little bit. And actually, we we quite like the 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 idea of the of the of the configurator, the web the web based design tool helping with this. So it will have within it some pre made house types that you can then go right that, but just a little bit longer or a little bit shorter or move the windows or things like that. So hopefully that's where the web tool um, will come in useful. Amazing. And one final question from Andrea. Uh, can anyone touch upon MEP waterproofing cladding solutions? Any recommendations or detailing available? Yeah, um, I probably skimmed over it very quickly in the presentation, but the um, the standard thing that we use, um, at least for so the UK climate, is that externally have a, have a waterproof breather membrane. Um, uh, and that it has a rain screen on, on top of it to sort of protect from UV and, and generally the elements longer term. But that provides most of your, your waterproofing. You still need flashing and sealing around doors and openings and and um, uh, and penetrations. But then um, the um, yeah the, that does the bulk of your waterproofing needs. Um, cladding wise, there's a pretty big range of options really. Um, we'd say try and use something that's dry fix. Um, you've got 18 mils of plywood OSB substrate to screw or nail to, so you can put kind of battens wherever you like, um, or, or you can, in some cases, fix directly to it with, with some other um, types of waterproof sheeting material. Um, but yeah, um, it's, it's, not, it's quite open and agnostic in terms of what you want to finish it with. Um, and the waterproofing is just get the, follow the ins, uh, installation uh, requirements for, for doing your breather membrane wrap correctly and um, you'll have a, have a good water tight house. Thank you. I was actually wrong. We have another more, another question, so I'll put it there. Uh, we saw in the design guide we need space under the house. Is there a minimum height to respect in the case of an inside building? And this is about the tiny house that's being built inside a hangar. Ah, uh, I see. Um, yes, I mean, it, it depends where, which location you're in because it's a building regulations limit, I think. I think the UK is 150 millimeters off the ground. Um, we'll have to have for, for a suspended timber floor. Um, there is another option which you might have seen um, from that peak barns project we did, uh, which the blocks can be used um, uh, fixed directly to um, uh, on a concrete slab. So you don't need to have a, have a wiki house floor or a timber floor. You can use a concrete slab um, and put the sole plates directly onto the concrete slab. 
and then make a notch in the in the bottom of those um, those wall blocks to to accommodate that sole plate. Um, a very much the same sort of size notch that is in the in the floor box. Um, we may produce mod, uh, block models for those for those with pre those notches built in, but it's it's kind of an easy thing to work out is just make a slot for the sole plate to fit into, and then the wiki house blocks are screwed to that sole plate. Um, there is a, a detail I think in the in the community forum um, that shows that exact connection. Um, but in the case of where you may be building inside a hangar, um, and uh, that might be an option. Um, or you, I think, yeah, for a case, yeah, for like a pod thing inside another building, you might just be able to put put it put the wiki house floor directly on top of the floor, maybe with like a DPM between the two, um, without any space between them. Um, I'm not sure exact exactly about use case, but um, worth exploring that. And we might be uh, able to talk a little bit more about it in the community if you want to make a post about it, um, Arno, in, in Belgium. Uh, one final, final question. Uh, have you updated 150 blocks in the 200 series? I've been playing with various combinations, but I cannot see how I can keep it all below 2.5 meters. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a bit tricky. Um, you, it, it involves breaking either, either breaking the wall height slightly and, and reducing the wall height from 2.1 to something but below 2.1. I think there's, if you use the 150 blocks, you end up with about sort of 50 mils over. Um, the the other option is that you can um, is a way you set your foundations and you set the height of the building. Um, uh, you need to mitigate anywhere for the level change, but you can um, if you set the building slightly lower into the ground. Um, that's also an option if you have um, sort of reasonable weatherproofing, waterproofing around the, the outside. Um, but the other the other way to, to sort of do a sort of clean suspended floor is to is to hack the wall blocks slightly, I think, um, to get them under that under that height. It's a bit of a challenge because we have to have a certain amount of thickness in the floor and the roof, otherwise it's not going to hold up. Um, and we don't want the floor bouncing and being springy and feeling a bit loose. So um you you can do it with the standard blocks. Um, we have, have had projects do it before, but um yeah, that's that's a bit of a challenge, and also because you want a bit of a pitch on the roof as well, because you want stuff to drain. So, um, yeah, but there Thank is the one hundred and fifty blocks. Sorry, we have updated; they're just not in the mm -hmm. library yet because they're um, they'll be one of the th things we add um, in the coming weeks. Brilliant. Thank you so much. That's the end of our questions and that's the end of our time. Thank you for staying on for a bit longer than usual. Uh, if you have any more questions, you can put them. Um, under the video or go to our community, community.wikihouse.cc, and we can have a longer conversation about uh, the different questions you have. Uh, thank you so much, and we'll see you soon. We'll see you uh, on the 30th of March for the next event. Bye.